It's time for Ask Mike Mondays. Mike answers one listener's question every week. Here's Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. Welcome to Ask Mike Mondays. I'm your host, Paul Peebles, National Underwriter for Old Capital. And with us today, one more time, the smartest guy in the room, the mayor of Beckerville, USA, Mr. Michael Becker. How are you in this warm July day? Yeah, Paul, things are going pretty good. Just uh, it's a Saturday as we record this, so we're gonna have a little, little family time today. So it's uh, everything's going good. And yeah, we're just about to get into August. And uh, what is the the talk around Dallas these days? Are the kids going back to school at some period of time, or is it going to be virtual? Is it being classroom? What's, yeah. what's the truth? It's a mess, right? I don't think everyone really uh, really knows what's going on as we record this. They just kind of announced that uh, I, I live in Dallas County, so the, the public schools in Dallas County are, can't go back to in-person class until after Labor Day. But now my kids go to private schools, so the private schools are, are exempt. So we may or may not go back on in person on the uh, – uh, it's usually around the 25th or, or so of August. So it might be the first two or three weeks of uh, homeschool hell again. So we're trying to, trying to figure all that out, and it's really – it's really difficult too, because you know, thinking thinking of people that have to, you know, physically be at a place to do a job, and you've got you know, husband and wife that both work, that need to need that income to pay the bills, and then you got kids that you rely on kind of daycare, and and then you know, it's not very easy, especially if you have elementary age kids like I do. They you got to sit there and help them. They're not like independent, so you got to you know help them through their stuff. And it's a it's a mess, Paul. I don't I don't know how we're gonna get past it. I'm I'm of the camp that we should definitely have the kids go back in, in person because they're you know falling behind kind of other kids in the, the developmental stage from you know historical perspective. So it's an absolute mess. So hopefully we hopefully we go back. Talking about craziness in the market itself. I mean, we've gone through this last six months of, of craziness with the coronavirus. How has your portfolio done in terms of occupancy and collections? I mean, I mean, you guys own and manage thousands of thousands of thousands of units. I mean, so how does it look these days? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're Dallas and, and we have, we have probably used in a small secondary market called Dallas, and everything else is in Dallas, Fort Worth, or Austin. Um, so we're tech, you know, Texas centric, but I mean, we build more in rental in July than, you know, than we ever have in history. So, you know, it's been the highest build month. So net net across the whole, the rents are going up, you know, occupancies are, are high and, you know, collections are a little bit off of historical normals. You know, historically you're, you know, some, we're, we're somewhere south of 1% delinquent. So, you know, meaning we're collecting 99 plus percent of, of scheduled grants. And, you know, here uh, we've been 97 or better. Uh, April, May, June, and July looks like it's uh, we're we're not quite done collecting, but looks like we'll basically be right on right on track to the, the last several months as well. So you know, and it's holding up pretty good, Paul. So from you know, from that standpoint, if we would have gone gone and hibernated in February and woke up and just looked at my financial statements only, not knowing anything else, you really would have seen very limited impact. You know, our, our retention percentages are up dramatically on on renewals. So, you know, we're, we're renewing at kind of, you know, all-time highs. We're being pretty modest and, you know, flat and negative in some cases. And in some cases where, you know, where the property's doing well, we're, we're pushing rental rates up on renewals. And the new leases are, you know, still, generally speaking, getting, you know, positive trade outs of the prior leases. So it's still uh, it's still working so far. You know, like we, we talk about, we're about to see what happens when, you know, if, uh, as we recorded, they haven't passed a, any sort of extension to stimulus monies or the CARES Act. So we'll see what happens once that money kind of runs out. That's clearly been supportive of our, our, our tenants capacity to pay us rent. But at the same time, you know, as we record this, unless something changes, which which is always changing, you know, we're about to have the ability to actually get, you know, evictions in the courts and access the court systems again. Our buddy John Ridgway actually wrote a, uh, a good op-ed at what was in the Dallas Morning News talking about kind of how it's unfair for, you know, landlords to not be able to access the court systems and, you know, we're being asked to bear the, the brunt and subsidize people's lives. So it seems, you know, challenging that, uh, that you know, the government's picking winners and losers and, and making us have to uh, subsidize these people. If they, they want to subsidize, um, you know, people, they should just give them a subsidy and allow them to pay their rent and allow me to force my contract which is my lease. So, uh, you know, not to get on my, my soapbox here. I know a lot of people don't cry for, for big landlords, but uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a challenging, weird environment that we're all living in. 
It certainly is. And so that's why we asked Michael some of these you know, very dynamic questions, because he has a very unique perspective because he's in the middle of this stuff. And so, you know, there's some people that just got started and there's some people that maybe have one property and they talk like they've been doing it for 10 years or 25 years and they haven't only been doing it for a couple of months. And so I certainly enjoy having Michael on and kind of you know, picking his brain and kind of figuring out really what's what's going on. So if you think we bring value, go into the Old Capital Podcast on iTunes and leave us a five-star report it, just to help us. We have 63,000 downloads a month, and we have thousands of people that listen to our podcast, and so we certainly do appreciate you spending time with us. And so if you give us a five-star rating, we would certainly would appreciate that. So here's the question for Michael, because... I think it's pretty timely. Uh, Mike, I am a fairly new real estate investor. I keep hearing that I should be buying older apartment buildings that need to be rehabbed because it gives me the highest return to my investors. All the gurus are telling me that. Is that true? So that's number one. So should you be buying older properties that need it for more rehab to these properties and maybe some challenging areas? But my real question is, should you only focus on investors that want no cash flow, so they're buying, say, a value-added property. So in the immediate future, that you know, there's no cash flow flowing from the property because you're rehabbing the property, and then get a capital gain in the future after everything's been fixed. Or should you pursue investors that need monthly cash flow today to supplement the lowering of the returns on their fixed income? So what say you, Mr. Michael? Yeah, man, I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong. We made a the first part of my career, I made a bunch of money and my reputation by some older, older multifamily deals that, that were broken that needed some value add. And so, I mean, I think that's a, a viable business model. Obviously, we, we've implemented that successfully many, you know, dozens of dozens of times. So, I mean, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with it. What we did when we first started buying apartments in 2013, we, you know, that's kind of what we focused on was exclusively you know, workforce housing C class. So in Texas, I think like 1960s or 1970s, kind of like year construction, and we transitioned up to like a more B class. I think kind of like 1980s for for year construction, and then now for the last uh, I don't know, about three four years, really what we've been trying to focus on is mainly kind of more that A minus to A product. And it's really just been a function of the marketplace. So I mean, I don't think I think that you're probably looking at the the problem from a raw perspective. It's probably the wrong question to ask. You know, the market is dynamic and it's always changing. You know, when we bought our first deal, you know, in Dallas Fort Worth, you could buy a brand new class A deal for like uh, in 2013, you buy a brand new class A deal for about a five cap. A B deal was like about a six, six and a half cap, and a C deal was like eight to eight and a half. And fast forward to, you know, today or say, say January 1, 2020, um, you know, an A deal was four and a half cap. Maybe uh, a B deal is about 475, and a C deal is like five to five and a quarter. Those are stabilized caps, and if you had value add, you're probably even uh, paying a lower cap rate. So what used to be, you know, three, three and a half percent spread from the top of the grade to the bottom of the grade, compressed where everything was, you know, right on top of each other, you know, so it's very, you know, probably within percentage point of each other. So to me, on a risk-adjusted basis, it doesn't make this doesn't make sense to pay the same or similar cap rate for something built in 1974 that you could for something built in 04 or 2014 even. So, um, you know, can you, do you have the ability to buy these larger, newer, bigger deals? Because it's just the price of poker grows up when you buy these these things. You got to pay, you know, the per door is, is higher and, you know, the, the seller is more sophisticated. So you got to you know, put up more earnest money, maybe take a little more risk from that, from that standpoint. You know, so everything's kind of associated with the deal. So if it's a good cap rate and the deal makes economic sense to the situation and on a risk adjusted basis, there's an older deal. I'll, I would look at it and buy it. But if uh, we're in the current environment and all the cap rates are the same, we're going to try to buy nicer, better stuff. So that's kind of how I look at it, Paul. To the second part of the question about, you know, focusing on investors that want current cash versus the ones that want the back end. So I don't I don't know if there's necessarily right or wrong to that either. I look at these deals again, kind of on a risk spectrum. You know, when, when I'm talking to people about it, what all my kind of thoughts are that, you know, if I'm looking at two deals, one's a, a value add deal, one's like a kind of a, a yield deal and and uh, very little upside into it. 
and uh, you know said that both are you know maybe the yield deals a, a 13 IRR and the value has a 15 IRR, but you know really is kind of a couple of components uh, internal rate of return or IRR. You got your kind of your current cash that are the cash flow paid along the way, and then you got your your capital gain at the end when you sell it. So the way I look at it, the more of the return that is in cash flow that is paid along the way, the lower risk there is in the deal, the more the return is is backloaded in a sale, the higher on the risk spectrum that deal is. Because, you know, I'm pretty good usually at thinking what my rents are going to be, say, 12 months down the road, but what a cap rate is going to be five years down the road, what I'm going to sell it for, you know, the further you go out on the time spectrum, the fuzzier, I guess, our crystal ball gets. Um, so the, the more risk there is in it. So that's kind of how I think about it, Paul. And, and, you know, I mean, there's not necessarily like a right or wrong answer, but just making sure that just because, you know, you're looking at a deal, this deal's a 14, that deal's a 15, but the the 15 is, you know, a deal in a tough location that is 60% occupied and all the return is going to be on the back end versus a 14 that you can get, you know, half or more of your return through cash flow. And it's a, you were a nicer deal in a better location, you know, I'd probably take a 14 over a 15 because a risk spectrum, you know, I don't know that 1% extra uh, return is is really worth all the additional risk. Yeah, I would um, also tell you that the investors, I mean, the ones that you're looking for to invest into your di- your transactions, you know, I look would look to the right, look to the left when you're at dinner and see that a lot of people that are having dinner sometimes out there, even if they're having dinner in a restaurant, you know, are older folks and they really do need to supplement their income. I mean, uh, we started off last year, I think, Goldman Sachs with Marcus uh, savings accounts. They were paying 2% or 2.15. I think uh, if you put some money into there right now, it's at 0.30. So people who've been living off their savings or their fixed income type of stuff, again, I'm not saying that the multifamily is backed by the full faith in government of the United States like a savings account or a money market account, but, you know, it just comes down to rates of return. And a lot of these older folks need rates of return just to supplement their monthly living expenses. And so I would talk with folks that need cash flow almost from the beginning and then don't have to always think about, uh, you know, I'm going to get cash flow, but get a big capital gain, but it may not happen for two or three years if you are, if they're going to invest in a large value added property. So, you know, Start maybe change up on who you're calling upon to seek investors. Look for the hands that have been raised that uh, are not receiving as much income as they were before that are looking for an income to get off on a quarterly basis of, you know, six, seven, whatever you can pay them on a cash on cash basis that makes sense with not incredibly high leverage that's, you know, fairly uh, risk adverse. Uh, Mike, talk a little, to me a little bit about interest rates. Everybody's been holding on and trying to maybe raise additional funds to take advantage of all those COVID-19 discounts. But back in March and going into April, everyone said, hey, listen, the uh, these uh, multifamily properties are going to be falling apart, and I want to need, need to raise money to, to come in and capture an opportunity into these deals. But uh, that really ha- has not happened. But the, the, this, what the discount has been is in the, in the capital markets and the interest rates. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, – what you're seeing with interest rates and that uh, what people should be pursuing. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's surprisingly that uh, we really haven't seen a whole lot of pricing variance. You know, I think it's, it's really down to, you know, our collections have really held up well. So the the durability of the income is, has been proven to be pretty resilient here in, in Texas multifamily. So the, the investors are, you know, looking around and, and we've been tracking a lot of capital from, you know, all over to, to come to Texas and, and multifamily. And I think, you know, people are, are looking at some of the, you know, crazy policies and stuff on that have uh, been, you know, or just landlord unfriendly policies in places like say California. And then, and then you're looking, I mean, you know, not to be political or anything, but you're looking at a lot of these major cities and, and they're, you know, letting riders burn down, you know, and topple statues and all sorts of crazy stuff like that. I just got back from Minneapolis and got a, got a tour of kind of down the street where all these burned out buildings and just, you know, just sad to, to see all that I mean, with your own eyes, you see it on TV and the, the driving to see these neighborhoods just you know, decimated. I mean, it's going to take, you know, years and years, uh, you know, decades for, for in, in some places to get these uh, cities to kind of be restored. And it's going to be, you know, very, very challenging. So, 
what I think is happening is, you know, capital wants, wants, you know, to flee to certainty and safety and, you know, try to get the best risk adjusted uh, returns it can. So, you know, on a relative basis, Texas, Florida, Arizona have been attracting a lot of uh, jobs and, and migration, you know, kind of the, the great economic migration we've seen in the last 20 years from high regulated areas to, you know, more free market states. And I think that uh, this is going to accelerate that pace and, and come in um, to places like like Texas multifamily. So I think it's really held up the pricing quite a bit. And now we're seeing, you know, like you said, so the discount really is coming in your your interest rate. So what was in the beginning of the year, you know, most of the, the loans you're probably doing, Paul, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but you were probably in that, that four to four and a half range, um, whether it was floating or fixed, you know, you're kind of in that plus minus four range. Where now, you know, uh, you're kind of that plus minus three, three range, right? So you're kind of in that, that low threes, whether you float it or, or you fix it. So you're seeing, you know, somewhere around a 25% discount in your interest expense. So that's really what what we're seeing, you know, and if you get 3%, and then we're also seeing the, the a lot of the escrows that were required have been rolled back. And it's probably just a matter of time before they're removed. All the uh, additional escrows will be removed altogether. Um, if we get, you know, six, nine months of, you know, kind of basically normal operating expenses and lenders won't feel compelled to do it. And we're starting to see some of the, a lot of the lenders went on the sidelines. We're starting to see that probably thawed a little bit. Fannie and Freddie and HUD were always lending. But I think it's just a matter of time. We're starting to see some of the life codes come in and then maybe, you know, the banks will be a little bit more aggressive. So those are largely still on the sideline, Paul. I don't know if you have any, any comments to that. But once those start coming and really get competitive, with the agencies, I mean, I think we're going to start seeing pricing probably go up as uh, the debt terms get even more um, favorable than what they are right now. No, I certainly agree with you. I mean, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are still doing a great job of uh, providing mortgage debt into the market for multifamily and you know, also single family, too. That's the majority of their business is single family, but you know, a lot of it is multifamily and they're, they're the primary source of mortgage money for when you buy an apartment building of of a million dollars up to say 50, 60, 70 million dollars. And so, you know, they're doing a great job. But I agree with you, at some period of time, these restrictions are, are going to go away for having additional funds for a rainy day in case that ever happens. So, you know, it hasn't happened right now, but they have, have reduced the exposure for, you know, taxes and insurance and replacement reserves. So if people wanted to get more information about what you do at SPI, what's the best way to do it? And again, what do you do at SPI? Yeah, what we're really focused on right now is just trying to put together uh, high quality opportunities, go out, raise capital and, uh, you know, buy, buy and operate apartment complexes in South Fort Worth and Austin. So that's what we're really trying to do. And if you want to find out some information about potentially investing alongside of us, the best way is simply go to a company's website, which is www.spiadvisory.com. That's SPI, like spy, advisory.com. There is a contact us form, fill that out, and we'll send you out some information about potentially investing uh, alongside of us. That sounds great. So again, uh, smartest guy in the room, Mr. Michael Becker, thanks for being on this hot uh, July, end of uh, July, beginning of August day. I'm Paul Peebles. Have a great day.